Thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. I feel very, very honored and very humbled to be able to share what little I know about entrepreneurship. Now, before I begin, I'd like to quickly share with you my life story. I don't know about you. I was born in a very poor family. I grew up among the poorest of the poor. Can you imagine when I was growing up, I had no new books, no new toys, no new clothing. I don't even have a bit until I was 21 years old. So if you look at my face, you'll find that it's a bit flat because I was sleeping underneath my grandmother's bed for the first 21 years of my life. So at a very young age, I always wanted to be a social worker. Why? Because I want to help more poor people like me. I want to help poor families like my families. And to prove to you how serious I was, I actually applied to be an intern to learn from a charity organization in Hong Kong. So I flew up to Hong Kong. Uh, I was an intern in a charity organization that rented a small little office space at the OYMCA building. So every day I would learn how to be a charity worker in the evening. I would sleep on one of the tabletop and every morning I would climb a hill opposite the OYMCA building. At the top of the hill, I'll pray, I'll plan, I'll prepare myself to be a social worker. When I came back, I decided to go and work because my friends said, how can you be a good social worker? You have no real life experience. You have not gone through any pain and sorrow. You need to earn your stripes and scars. Then you can become a very good social worker. So off I went, but I was very, very blessed. I started my life literally as an office boy. I was promoted almost every year of my career. I became the CEO of a multinational, multi-billion dollar company. Then I started my own business. I was again very, very blessed because most people have never listed one company in their lifetime. I've helped to list more than three companies in my lifetime. The first one in New York Stock Exchange, second one in Australia Securities Exchange, and then the last one in Singapore Exchange. Along the way, uh, we started six different charities. Today, our charities, we train 20,000 students free of charge, including IT students. We uh, reach out to 3,500 elderly. We have a charity that look after a community of the poorest of the poor, including 258,400 migrant workers. And every time when there's a crisis, we will do something to help the victims of the crisis. And then in 2013, I was very, very blessed because a very rich man offered to buy over my publicly listed company. And at a point in time, I was also invited to speak in a CEO conference. So they invited CEO from all over the world to Hong Kong. Uh, they flew me up to Hong Kong, checked me in the hotel room. When I was in the hotel room, I drew the curtain. After I drew the curtain, I looked out of the window. I saw a hill opposite the window. And that hill looks very, very familiar. I had goosebumps all over my body. So I quickly called the receptionist. I said, what was this hotel known as before it became a hotel? And the receptionist told me casually, this used to be known as the OYMCA building. That evening in the hotel room, I went on my knees and I cried. I cried like I've never cried before because all my life I wanted to be a social worker, but I never found the opening to become a professional social worker. When I thought I've come to the end of my entrepreneur and investment journey, I realized I've always been a social worker. And let me quickly explain to you why. If I have been a professional social worker, I probably could have touched one person's life at a time, one family at a time. But when I became an entrepreneur, I could literally touch thousands of people's lives all over the world. And that's why today I teach two master's degree program for working adults. I teach entrepreneurship at MBA level at one of the universities. I teach working adults how to become successful in the business world. I also teach a master's degree program on social work, how to run charity organization. And so that evening, I found a new purpose for my life. I found a new calling. I found a new personal mission. I tell myself for as long as I live, I will do everything I can to inspire as many people as possible to become entrepreneurs. Why? When you become an entrepreneur, you can do so much more for your loved ones. You can help the poor, the needy, and the disadvantaged. You can make the world a better place to live in. So I hope through this webinar, I can inspire many of you to consider joining us in the world of entrepreneurship. By the way, if you look at the slide right now, if you will see that uh, that's the current YMCA building. Right beside the building is the hotel that I stayed in. 
And then the old photo on the right shows the hill that I climbed every morning years ago. At that point in time, there was no staircase. Looking back now, I've come to realize that all of you have whatever it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. Many people tell me, but Patrick, I need money to make money. I don't have what it takes to start, run, and grow a business. I want you to know this. You know, the fact is this. Many successful entrepreneurs have started poor. And many poor people have broken out of uh, the poverty cycle and become successful entrepreneurs. And I've always said this. The greatest poverty is not a poverty of money. The greatest poverty is a poverty of dreams, tenacity, and action. The first question you need to ask yourself is this. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Because if you don't know the why, you will never find out the how. It is your purpose that will always shape your influence, your performance, pursuits, and progress. So let me quickly share with you why I became an entrepreneur. In 1992, I was standing alone at the window of my office. It was about 10 p.m., almost the end of another long day at work. As I looked out of the window, the view was dotted with many blinking lights. They were shining from ships that were docked at the coastal waters of Singapore. Those lights reminded me of how successful Singapore has become as one of the busiest ports in the world. But that night, I also realized how busyness had crowded my life and was gradually squeezing the life out of me. When the real estate agent first found the office, she sold me on the beautiful sea view. But little did we both know that the government had embarked on a massive reclamation project. The government did such a great job. Shortly, the sea view became largely a reclaimed land view. And at the rate the reclamation was going, I told my friends all over the world that I would eventually be able to drive to their countries. I was kidding, of course. The landscape right in front of my window was changing rapidly. That reclaim, the reclaimed land became what is known today as Marina Bay, the latest addition to the central business district. That evening, I felt the pace of change all around me. Time was also somewhat running ahead of me. It was like the train of life had left the station without me. I was still standing on the platform with my luggage, not knowing where to go and what to do. And as I stood all alone, thinking about the fast-changing landscape, my heart was very troubled. Looking out the window, what I saw was not just the darkness out there. I saw darkness within me and how it was reflected in my future. In that darkness, however, there was a glint of divine hope. I had an epiphany that night. A light bulb, as they say, has just lighted up in my mind. At that point, I was running the regional operation of a reputable multinational think tank. I was very well paid, given lots of freedom and managing many exciting projects. But despite all that, I had become unhappy. I realized my job was going nowhere and in fact, it was leading me to a dead end. My career was never going to get me what I wanted in my life. Purposeful freedom. And to me, purposeful freedom include financial freedom, time freedom, lifestyle freedom, and contribution freedom. I would never have all the money that I needed to fulfill worthwhile dreams. And neither would I have the time to turn my dreams into a reality. I would never be able to do the things I wanted to do and achieve whatever I wanted to achieve and enjoy whatever I wanted to enjoy in life. More importantly, I would never have contribution freedom. I would never have the freedom to provide the best of life to my loved ones, pay back what I owed to society, put to rights many of the wrongs in our world and leave a positive legacy for future generations. My job and company would always somehow stand in the way and prevent me from making my dreams come true. It was hard to admit until that evening that my job and company have become somewhat like a prison. And that prison is even more frightening than a conventional prison with bars and locked doors. That evening, I decided to jump into the muddy, murky, and even maddening world of entrepreneurship to pursue true freedom 
of purposeful freedom. Throughout my entrepreneurial journey, I've helped to list more than three companies and I would like to share four of my entrepreneurial stories with all of you and the lessons that I've learned along the way. First lesson, I was part of the team that helped to take Gartner Inc. public on New York Stock Exchange. Now, for those who don't know, Gartner is the world's leading research and advisory company. It is sometimes known to be a futurist because we help our clients predict the future and navigate through the future. I remember we had a meeting with our CEO then, Mr. Manny Fernandez in Kenya, Africa. All of us were sitting under a huge tent on a hot afternoon. And Manny told us what we thought was a crazy idea. He said, I have a simple idea to sell one of our $20,000 products for just $5. A product that we've been selling like hotcakes to many customers for just $5. In doing so, he said, we will not be targeting just a niche market. We will focus on covering the general market and one day we will become a well-known brand. Subsequently, Gartner became a public listed company and a billion dollar company. I remember very clearly many people under the tent were sniggering, sneering, and even skeptical. Long story short, Gartner is today valued at more than 14 billion US dollar. I learned a few important lessons from this phase of my ent entrepreneurial journey. First, many entrepreneurs spend a lot of time, sometimes overly amount of time, searching for the best business idea. What is key is not just the idea, but whether you can keep improving the idea to become a world-beating idea. Second, regardless of who you are, if you want to be an entrepreneur, Learn how to list, run, and grow a public listed company or a world-class company even before you start a business. That way, you know what it takes to run a great company. You start right on day one, and then you have easier time to finish well. Learn how to attract people to invest their money to support your business. In addition, run your company as if it is a public listed company right from day number one. Run your business as if it is a world-class company right from the beginning. Let me give you an example. When I first ran my private company, I used the services of Deloitte & Touche, one of the big four auditing firms. Many people think I'm crazy because it's a waste of money, they said, to hire one of the most prominent and expensive auditing firms. I think otherwise. Deloitte Deloitte and Touche helped our company to set up a world-class accounting system to help us propel further and higher in business. Last but not least, hire the right people, not necessarily the best people. Hire the right people to do the right job and to work in the right way as a team. I've come to realize that it is the people in your business that makes your business work. It is the people in your organization that makes your organization work. Therefore, don't treat the people around you as just a human resource or worse, a digit, a utility, or a tool. Bring out the best from each and every one of them. Help them to live a meaningful, exciting, and fulfilling life. When you invest in human lives, you live the best life. The more you reach out to bless other lives, the richer and better your business and your life will become. Second story. During the era of the dot-com boom, we started a technology company. We were once ranked number seven in the Asia-Pacific by Deloitte & Touche. Can you imagine at a point we were ahead of companies such as Alibaba, Innosys, Tata Infotech, and many other tech giants? One of the top guns at Temasek indicated interest in investing in our company. Tomasek was one of the most sought-after and biggest investors of dot-com businesses. I said no to that top gun. And that became one of the biggest regrets in my entrepreneurial journey. Eventually, we spent about $4.5 million to prepare for listing on NASDAQ. Our company was valued at a point at US $380 million. Shortly thereafter, before we list the company, the global economic crisis started. 
the stock market crashed and it also crashed our dreams and our hopes too. From this event, I learned a few key lessons that my professors didn't teach me in my MBA classes or even in my doctorate degree program. The profit advantage and growth of a business depends in a major part on tapping the capital market. As you grow and globalize your business, you have to learn how to raise more and more capital to take your business to a higher level. Also, that's another important lesson. Deep in your heart, you know what you need to do to achieve greater successes. Even as a student, you, need, you, need, you know deep in your heart what you need to do to become a good student, a successful student. Whatever you have to do, do it now. Don't look back in your life and say what I believe to be the four saddest words that can come from mouth or from the keyboard. And the four saddest words are, if only I have. If only I have. Third story. My partner and I had a small little dream. We wanted to change the world. And to do that, we had a very, very simple idea. We thought to ourselves, what if we could bring world-class gurus to ordinary persons on the streets, transfer world-class knowledge and expertise to these people? And as a result, we would be able to improve their performance, their contributions, and their results. And in doing so, we could improve families, communities, and the society. Long story short, we paid a lot of money to bring in top-class gurus and experts. And we got them to teach in some of the biggest convention halls, including indoor stadiums and even football stadiums. Through economy of scale, we could make first-class knowledge and expertise available, accessible, and affordable to ordinary persons on the streets. Many people told us, until today, our idea was a stupid idea. Our idea will never work. We will lose our pants. We are thankful for all the feedback. Many of the good feedback compel us to improve. On the other hand, we told ourselves we would never let any negative feedback stand on our way to success. In any case, we went through many failures before we found the best way to make our business model work. And eventually, we turned the business model into a cookie cutter system. And we implemented a similar model literally all over the world. And we have continued to improve our business model. We became arguably the largest personal development seminar organizer in the world. And for a period, we listed our company on Australia, on Australian Securities Exchange. Along the way, we acquired many other businesses and assets. I learned a few key lessons from this phase of my entrepreneurial journey. First, have what I call a purposeful, radical, inspirational, scalable, and magnetic mission that will motivate others to support your corporate growth. Think of how to scale your business right from the beginning. Learn how to start globally and then systemize your business model so that you can go global. All of you live in the best of times. I cannot think of a better time in your life to do whatever you want to do. Enjoy whatever you want to enjoy and achieve whatever you want to achieve. If you seriously want to start a business and you start a business in this generation, you have every possibility to build a global business just like we did. As a public listed company, you can have the latitude to acquire more assets and other resources to grow and globalize your business. My final story that I want to share with you 
is how we took my last company public in Singapore Exchange. Years ago, I took over the running of a small real estate company. At that point, the business was considered to be part of what they call a mom and pop business or mom and pop industry. Hard to grow much bigger and limited in put profit potential. Long story short, we kept changing the business model. We keep breaking every major glass ceiling facing us. When we listed the company on Singapore Exchange, we had more than 10,000 people operating from our commercial building. At the throw of the SARS crisis, I had a divine inspiration to put love at the core of our business model and make love a guiding principle of our operation. As we grow the company, we turned our organization into the extended family of our people and our office, their second home. Over time, we added many facilities to make our people happy and well. We had a childcare center, a kindergarten, a cafeteria, a restaurant, a beer garden, a gymnasium, a hair salon, a spa, a monsieur, and a multifunctional hall to run all kinds of entertainment and leisure activities. At the same time, we started our own charities, launched many charitable initiatives, and played our small little part to make a positive impact on our communities and society. Along the way, I learned a few key lessons. First, the past is not destiny. You have to keep improving the business model to seize the future. The professionals who help us list our company, including bankers, lawyers, and auditors, told me just before we listed our company that most companies will receive their fair share of complaints. I'm really thankful that when we listed our company, we did not receive a single complaint. And one of the reasons is because I'm guided by four questions. Is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it good for branding? Is it the right thing to do? Always do good. Don't do anything bad. Do well and do good at the same time, all the time. Last but not least, build a love based organization. Love yourself. If you cannot love yourself, you cannot love others. If you cannot love yourself, it will be very hard pressed for others to love you. Just as importantly, love whatever business you have started, whatever company you have joined, whatever job and career that you're involved in. Love your products and services. Love your colleagues. Love your customers. Love your other stakeholders. Love your business, your industry, your community, your country, and the world at large. Let me just conclude with two sayings from our company. We call them Gagspeak. If you don't love and serve your people, you don't deserve and qualify to be a leader. In a similar way, if you don't love and serve your people, including your colleagues, your customers, and the other stakeholders, you don't deserve and qualify to be an entrepreneur or an investor. When you invest in human lives, you live the best life. The more you reach out to bless others, the richer and better your life will become. I hope you have enjoyed this seminar. Uh, if you uh, enjoy this seminar, I have many other educational seminars I've posted on my YouTube channel. You can go to my YouTube channel and subscribe to uh, my YouTube channel. And I plan to upload more educational webinars and interviews with inspirational leaders to help you on your journey to achieve sustainable success. So you can go to QR code and then uh, go to my YouTube channel and become one of my subscribers 
And I want to be able to continue to inspire you beyond this webinar, not just to be an entrepreneur, to be an enlightened entrepreneur. An enlightened entrepreneur is somebody that will contribute not just to financial bottom line, but also to social, environmental, and spiritual bottom line. That together with all of us, we will strive to make this world a better place, including helping the last, the lost, the lonely, and the least. We have every chance as an entrepreneur and a potential entrepreneur to go out there and make this world a better home. Thank you very much. I am ready for whatever questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Liu. That was a really um, interesting sharing. And thank you for sharing your stories, not just of the successes that you've had, but also of the failures. I think, uh, you know, it's good for our students to know that um, it's not always a smooth sailing road when they want to try to, you know, uh, do business or, 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 you know, they will face a lot of different challenges. Okay, for students who are here and you are keen to ask Dr. Liu questions, uh, you can do so by keying in questions in the Q&A. If you scroll down uh, to the bottom of your screen, you can see a Q&A tab. Uh, if this is being screened in the classroom and you don't have access to the Q&A, you can actually WhatsApp the question to me at 8752-8036, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code ITEVCF, and you should be able to ask questions there. All right, so Dr. Liu, while our students are getting ready to prepare their questions, let me get the ball rolling by asking you a first question uh you know I when like we... in, i feel like i'm in examination hall <laughs> all over again <laughs> no it's just a conversation um when we were looking at speakers to invite for this event you know we we it, you know of course we did our homework and we did our research and we of course oh, no, went to I, your I, linkedin I, profile am I, am I getting worried now my sins are being <laughs> discovered right if so, you discover any skeletons, please let me know. Uh, my father <laughs> and mother are super proud of me until today. Yeah. <laughs> Not skeletons, but we saw that your profile, you are involved in so many things. And, you know, when, when I look at, you know, all the different, uh, you know, things that you're involved in, what is a typical day like for you? You know, how do you manage your time with, with so many commitments and so many businesses and all that? What is a typical day like for you? That's a very, very good question. Uh, first of all, uh, let me share with you one of the principles that I have. Uh, I make it a point not to uh, work in the business. I make it a point to work on the business. In other words, you know, if, uh, if I have to go to work and work very, very hard, then my business will be able to grow. Then to me, I'm not an entrepreneur. But if I can run a business in such a way, the business can grow on its own without me, then I think I become a good entrepreneur. So in other words, I make it a point to be an organizational man. When I run a business, I make sure that I set up the business model. I come with a good plan. You know, I bring in the best talents and then lead, motivate and inspire them. And together with them, we systemize our whole business operation. In other words, the system can be easily implemented. It can be easily taught. It can be easily implemented, not just in Singapore, but all over the world and still be able to achieve good results. And then as a team, we can continue to improve on our business model and operation, then there will come a point in time where the business can free me up to do whatever I want to do. So that's my first principle of running a business. Second, the principle that I have in running my life, you know, is I've decided long time ago that, you know, I want to be able to major on the major, minor on the minus. So a lot of people got it wrong the other way around. So uh, I'm very, very focused every uh, morning, you know, to review my plan and my goal. And then the, as a discipline, as part of my habitual lifestyle, I will decide what are the important things that I want to do, what are the things that I don't have to do by myself, what are the things I can get other people to help me to do so that I can focus on the most important things. And sometimes when you do the most important thing, the most important thing, will help you, free you up to do other things. And when you achieve the most important things, 
somehow they can also resolve the rest of the things uh, that you need to do in your life. So uh, long story short, I make sure that I'm being freed up. You know, uh, I work myself out of every job. I work myself out of every business so that I can continue to take a helicopter view, take a 50,000 feet view uh, to focus on the mm. other areas and developing other areas of my life. Mm. So I, I think that ties it. in, yeah, that, that ties in with what you shared earlier. I think, was it with Gartner, where you talked about hiring the right team and getting the right people to, to do that the job for you. Um, but I've got a question that, that came on from one of the students. So what about your very first experience, you know, when you first started out, you know, you, you, you don't have money, you, you don't have, how, how do you hire a team? So how, how is that like, you know, when you first started out, how do you actually get the right people then? Okay, I've learned a long time ago that uh, I don't need money to make money. I've also come to realize that many poor people who don't have money were able to break break out of the poverty cycle. I've also come to realize that many, many successful entrepreneurs started as being poor. So the first thing you need to remember is this. If you believe you need money to make money, then you will always be poor. But if you believe there are a lot of people that could even become successful, become rich and wealthy, and do many more things when they first started their life without money, then you know that it is possible. So the first thing you must remember is this. You must believe it is possible. The greatest poverty, as I mentioned just now, is not a poverty of money. The greatest poverty is a poverty of dreams, tenacity, tenacity and action. In other words, if you don't have a dream you know, to be successful, it's not going to work. If you don't have the tenacity to press on and press on and pressing on, you will never be able to achieve your dream. And if you're not willing to take massive action, then it's not going to work. So let me give you an example. Even as a young boy, when I was studying, I've already started running my own business. And today I run a charity called Junior Achievement Singapore. We are training, we have been training more than 20,000 people every year before the pandemic. Last year, we trained more than 11,000 people and we train them to become an entrepreneur. And we always tell them your biggest obstacle is not money. Your biggest obstacle is you. The biggest asset is not money. The biggest asset lies between your two years, your knowledge and your expertise. Let me give you an example. When I started my uh, business as a young student, I decided that I will sell something that is needed in every home. I sell what the Hokkien call the, uh, sabun chui, you know, detergent. And I didn't have money to buy the detergent. What I did was uh, I had a sample and I will go and approach customers door to door. And I convinced them that they need my detergent. And one of my convincing points was to start educating my customer, you know, that they should use detergent uh, that is biodegradable. And we, today we know what biodegradable, be, what biodegradable means. Today, most detergents are biodegradable. But in the, old, in the days of old, there were many different uh, detergents that has got funny chemicals. And there's no way you can clean the chemicals properly. But when you use a biodegradable detergent, you know that it's good for the environment and it can also be healthier than using detergent that's got strange chemical. So I will convince uh, my customers, you know, to use biodegradable detergent. I will convince them instead of going to a supermarket or to the provision shop a few times in a year to buy detergent, I will sell them concentrated detergent and they can use it throughout the year. So it's a whole lot cheaper, a whole lot healthier, and a whole lot uh, better in terms of using my detergent. And so by collecting the order, by collecting the deposit, I had enough money, then I will go and buy the detergent. So I collected uh, somebody else's uh, order first, then go and buy the detergent. And that's how I've always started my business. Even when I was running what today is arguably the largest seminar company in the world, you know, we did not pay money you know, for the speakers, you know, we book the speaker first and then we will go and sell the tickets and then we get them to pay money for tickets. When we collect enough money for a ticket, then we start to pay for the speakers. So we have a cash upfront first 
And that's how it goes with every one of my business. Even in Gartner, we don't deliver them our service before we collect the money. We ask them to pay us. Then we would be able to start to develop our services and deliver the services. So technically, you know, we run it without any money at all. So let me just summarize. First of all, believe that you can become an entrepreneur even if you have not a lot of knowledge, not a lot of time, not a lot of resources, uh, including money and not a lot of experience. Secondly, believe that the greatest asset that you have is your knowledge and expertise. In other words, with entrepreneurial knowledge, knowledge and expertise, you will be able to think, to think of products and services that would be able to meet needs of your customer or needs that are not as well fulfilled or needs that can be better fulfilled. And if your customer you know, likes your product, if your product can value it to your customer, they'll be more than happy to pay you before you deliver the product. And it's only a question of how you toggle between taking the order, buying the product, or developing a product to deliver to your customer. I'm simplifying the whole process, but whether you sell a simple detergent, you sell a very high level uh, computer system, which I, was, which I was involved in, or you sell a very high level cons uh, consulting job, or if you are in the capital market like YM, you know, I deal with uh, projects that goes into millions of dollars. We acquired, for example, buildings. I don't have money to buy so many buildings. Basically, you know, I uh, find good buildings that can generate good returns and show it to uh, my high net worth individual customers or my high net worth, my, my, uh, my well-to-do corporate customers. And they love the investment. They love the returns. They give me the money. And then I pull the money to invest in a building. Of course, I have to first uh, approach the Monetary Authority of Singapore and get their green light before I can do something like this. So my point is very simply this. You don't need money to make money. What you need is to make sure that you are plus factor. You are providing good value addition. You are helping your customers to become better. And in doing so, they'll be more than happy to finance you in running your business. I hope I've answered your question. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you have a good idea, people buy into it and then they're willing to pay money up front. If you, your idea is not that great, then they probably wouldn't trust to give you the money beforehand. So that brings us to our next question. Uh, I've got quite a number of students here actually asking. Um, early on in your presentation, I think one of the things that you shared was um, to be an entrepreneur, you need to know why, and then the how will follow. So we talk about purpose, uh, being purposeful. So how would you know that, you know, how or what, or perhaps um, what kind of framework or what kind of um, thought process can, can you share with our students to help them to discover this why? Because it's quite abstract, you know, but, but how do you know that, that that's, that's your purpose? Okay, first of all, let me share with you what I call a principle of precession. For every force, there's a resulting force that's even more powerful than the first force. So when you drop a stone into a puddle of water, you get reapers. The earth and the sun, they, are, they both have gravity. They attract one another because of the force of the gravity attracting each other. It causes the uh, earth to orbit around the sun. So in other words, if you want to be an entrepreneur, what do you focus on? For example, all I want to focus on is how to take your money, how to make you buy uh, all kinds of nonsensical products so that I can become rich and wealthy. So if your first force and all you care about is making more money, serving your own personal interest, furthering and advancing your own aspiration, then you will never become a happy person because you only make money you only are happy when you make the next $1 and you become a greedy person. But more importantly, you are set up to fail. Can you imagine if uh, an entrepreneur go to you, they look in your eyes and when you look in their eyes, uh, all you see is the dollar sign. You look at a face, you see a money face. You will never want to be a, a friend with such a person. You will never want to do business with a person, let alone buy any product or services or support this particular person, basically. So what do you need to do before somebody is willing uh, to buy from you, to uh, do business with you, to support you, to finance you. So you have to think, what value addition are you uh, offering to the person? What can you make your customers or potential customers much better? 
And when you can think along that line, people will be very happy to help you out. Now, I know in ITE, there are many, many different programs. Let me give you an example. I have a personal fitness coach. He was a graduate from ITE, you know, in sports science. And he came to me and says, you know, I'm from ITE. I spent a lot of time studying about sports science. Uh, my calling uh, was to be a coach. Since young, I always feel it's very important for me to help people be, become fitter and stronger and healthier. When they're fitter, stronger and healthier, they will become better being. They will be able to become more successful. And to him, nothing gave him greater joy than to see people becoming fitter, stronger and healthier. I buy into his vision. I buy into his purpose. I pay him money to coach me on a personal basis. You know, I pay him like $100 every, for every hour he spent with me. I spend three, uh, at one stage, three times a week with him. So in other words, just with me alone for three hours, he make $1,200. Just for three hours every week, he make for me $1,200 a week. If he spend another three hours per week, he make $2,400. He make more money than many diploma and even uh, degree uh, holders. So my point is very simply this. What drives you to want to do something for other people? And to help you to understand this, I call this the, the five Ps. First of all, deep in our heart, we all have this sense that we want to serve a purpose. So for this coach of mine, his purpose was to help people become fitter, stronger, and healthier. Secondly, it has to do with your personality. Somehow in the process of growing up, you know that something fits your personality, something doesn't fit your personality. The third piece is called the passion. What do you love to do? For me, I hate to be standing in front of a machinery. I don't like to push paper. I know that's not what I want to do. But I know for a fact that I love to work with people. So that's my passion. And then the fourth piece is performance. What can you do well? Or what can you invest your, your time, your energy, your efforts, and you can become good at it? And then the last P is your priority. So imagine you've got this four circle, your purpose, your personality, your passion, your performance, your priority. Of course, in the ideal world, all these four circles come together and you say, I want to do something that fulfill my purpose, fit my personality, you know, something I'm passionate about, something I can perform very, very well and it's top priority in my life. But somehow on the journey of life, we never work like this. We all have to make some compromises. For example, I started my life as an employee and technically I was like an office boy. We don't have this term called an office boy. During my time, you know, in every organization, there's this little boy that does everything that nobody wants to do and he gets kicked around to do anything and everything for everybody, you know. And to me, that was not something I want to do, not something I love to do. But, but by doing this, I learned how to do a bit of everything. I learned how to be able to do a bit of everything in organization. And eventually, I became a very useful person because I was the only person in our organization, you know, that can do a bit of sales, a bit of marketing, a bit of uh, inventory management system, a bit of IT work. And eventually, I became, you know, uh, one of the general managers of the company, basically. So I hope I've given you some ideas on how you can find your purpose in life. Thank you. All right, and now our next question um, from our student is, what are some of the struggles you faced as an entrepreneur and how did you manage to overcome this? And there's a First second all, part to this uh, question, if you don't mind. Um, and, you know, how do you know when to stop? You know, when do you, when do you push on? And, and how do you know when to stop? So yeah. you face struggles and, and how do you overcome? And how do you know when enough is enough? Okay, first of all, uh, let me uh, correct the notion in case you have this notion that struggling, making mistake, and failure is bad. These things are not bad. It's how you respond to a failure, a mistake, and a failure that makes it good or bad. To me, you will always go through many different struggles as a human, as a finite being, you will always make mistakes. As a mortal human, you will always fail. But you may not be able to change the failure. You can change yourself. You may not be able to change the failure. You can change your response to the failure. You may not be able to change the failure. You can find a better way to overcome your failure or find other better ways to get better results. You may not be able to change your failure, but you certainly can find people to help you to respond to a failure. You may not be able to change your failure or your struggle, but you certainly can use this failure 
to become like a feedback mechanism. Your failure become professors and teachers in your life to help you be a better, stronger, and more resilient person. You may not be able to change your failures and struggles in life, but you can soar above your failures and struggles to be able to help those other people in your life who are also struggling, who have gone through failures in your life. So my point is very simply this. Struggles and failures are part and parcel. They are lampposts that guide you on the entrepreneurial journey. They are like the stars that help you to navigate, you know, through the muddy, murky and maddening, uh, you know, waters of uh, entrepreneur journey. Secondly is this. Let me just quickly share with you what you need to do when you're going through struggle. First of all, you need to be able to learn how to rest. You need to know how to take time to relax and have recreation. Be at peace with yourself. Because when you are at peace yourself, when you're relaxing, when you're devoting your time for other activities, you are like sharpening your eggs to be able to chop more trees. Secondly, you must be able, you know, to redesign your life and lifestyle. So in other words, sometimes your struggles are exacerbated by what you do every day in your work, in your student life, and your other lifestyle, basically. So you need to spend time to reflect and think how you want to redesign your life. Thirdly, you need to be able to reframe all your problems and challenges and struggles. As I've mentioned to all of you, you know, you can look at, uh, failures as an opportunity. You can look at struggle as an opportunity or struggle as a challenge. And then you need to re-engineer the way you handle the struggles, the challenges and the failures in your life to be able to say, how can I make use of it for the better? Then you need to be able to reframe your whole uh, mental and emotional inputs. So this is what I do. I will make sure that, you know, I will flood or immerse or saturate or force feed all my five senses with everything that's positive. So a lot of time, the struggles is not just because of an external force, but because we either create the own struggles or we make the struggle worse than what it should be. So if I have to see anything, I make sure that I see things that are positive. If I have to eat anything, I make sure it's positive because I know for facts if I eat nonsensical food, if I eat unhealthy food, you know, I put greater stress on my body, I put greater stress on my mind, I put greater, uh, greater, greater stress on my, uh, on my emotion. The last thing is called reaching out to other people. I know it sounds very uh, uh, counterintuitive. I spend a lot of time uh, helping uh, various charities, various social missions, uh, I spend a lot of time offering my services to a lot of non-profit uh, association, uh, society, and uh, all kinds of uh, initiatives. Because I realize the more you reach out to help other people, the more you're helping yourself. It is like what someone said, you can complain about your shoes until you see somebody without legs. You think you have the worst struggle. You think you've gone through the most difficult challenge. You have you think you have dropped into the, the most, uh, the greatest depth of failure. But when you see somebody who's gone through even worse struggle than you, then you realize you're blessed. And then you realize that you have everything it takes to rise up from every failure, to go through every struggle, to soar to the stars of your dream. I hope I've given you some points to be able to think through, reflect upon, and see struggles in a different light and hopefully to be able to use struggle to make you a much better person. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so it's all about perspective, isn't it? Not just, you know, focusing on the negative, but the positive things around you and kind of reaching out to others and seeing what kind of different experiences other people have. So I've got a very interesting question. I think one by of the way, students... Uh, by the way, I just recorded a webinar on uh, how we should respond to the pandemic, which mm. is very similar to what you are saying. Many people are struggling at this point in time. Mm have called this pandemic the worst crisis of this century but i also yep. believe it is the greatest opportunity of our entire lifetime so i hope you subscribe to my youtube channel uh in a few weeks time i will upload this webinar and you can see uh what you can do to overcome some of the struggles 
uh, I will be able to phrase it in a much better way than <laughs> just answering the question which I did. Yeah. Sure. We'll, we'll post the link of the YouTube channel as well in the chat so that our students can see. Uh, and I think we have time for one last question. And I think this is quite interesting, a student message. And I think this student must be quite inspired by what he or she has heard over this session. And he asks very simply, I want to start a business, but I think my parents don't want. <laughs> so what should I tell them? And so what advice do you have, you know, if there are students who are keen, you know, but their parents, you know, have some resistance, what, what, what advice do you have for them? Okay, the first question is this. What is, uh, if you remember what I mentioned to you, you have to sit back, reflect on five key domains of your life, your purpose in life, your personality, your passion, your performance and your priority. Some things are good to do, nice to do, maybe they're not the most important thing to do. So the question I want to pose to you is this, assuming you are a student, what is your top priority right now? I think that your top priority is to be a student, is to be the best in whatever you're doing right now. Because if you live your life with the value or the principle that I just want to get by, go through the motion, then you will never become a very successful entrepreneur. If today you are a student, be the best you can be as a student. Focus on being a very, very good student. But having said that, there are people who are very good students who can still balance their academic work with being able to run a business and be able to not just find a balance, but integrate both things together. And I've seen this happening. Then by all means, you know, uh, go and talk to your parents. Convince your parents. I think your, your greatest worry, the greatest worry of your parent, and I'm a parent, I'm speaking as a father of two uh, beautiful daughters. I think what your parents are worried about is that you will compromise your your life as a student, you'll compromise your academic results. So your parents don't want you to overstretch yourself. But if you can convince your parents that you can be a very good student, and at the same time, you can run a business, and your business is not going to be overwhelming, is not going to overstretch you. In fact, your business can actually complement whatever you're doing now as a student and put you in a better state, a better position to succeed in the future. I'm sure your parents would have a, a more open mind to listen to you. And if you cannot convince your parents, then there'll be somebody else who can convince your parents. There'll be some, uh, some uncles, some aunties, some friends of your parents that you can convince to help you convince your parents. And if you cannot convince all of them, then you have to find ways to talk to your parents again and again. By the way, I'm teaching you how to be an entrepreneur because uh, life is never a bed of roses. Not every customer is going to say yes to you. You have to find some way to keep going back to them again and again, find different ways to convince them, improve your argument, improve your better proposition, or turn it into a transactional uh, proposition where we say, what can I do for you so that you allow me to start a business? You know, I mean, for all you know, your, your parents will say, if you get a B grade, for example, then you can be an entrepreneur. You know, I help uh, one a student of uh, a student to convince the parents and, uh, and the student promised the parent the next examination, this is the grade I'm getting. If I get a grade, then you allow me to be an entrepreneur. So there was a transactional relationship and he has to live by his commitment. He has to deliver what he promised. And so there was a compromise, so to say, uh, parents are not together most happy. The students are not together most happy, but such is life, right? And such is what such is uh, what we do and what happened to us as entrepreneurs every day. We never get the most perfect solution, but we always work towards having a perfect solution.